this beautiful and ridiculously cute slug is a real animal called Costasiella kuroshime, also known as the leaf sheep. I wanted to make this video because of its unlikely appearance, its features that make it look like a cartoonish grazing ungulate. But the more I learned about this animal, I realized it is unlike any other animal on the planet. Not just in appearance, but in its entire mode of existence. It's an animal that's evolving to work like a plant. I know this sounds far-fetched, but Sacoglossin sea slugs like the leaf sheep survive in large part by using photosynthesis. They steal chloroplasts from algae, and then harbor this chloroplast within their own cells. And depending on the species, they can survive for days, months, or even years on nothing but the energy from photosynthesis. At first glance, it seems like symbiosis, sort of like what corals do. Corals house a photosynthetic algae called zooxanthellae that provide nutrients to the corals. But this is different. Sacoglossins are not harboring entire algae organisms, they're just stealing the algae's photosynthetic organelles and then doing photosynthesis themselves. It's like if we ate spinach once and then were able to get our energy from the sun for months afterwards. And making this all even weirder is this photosynthetic superpower also allows them to intentionally chop off their own heads and regrow every part of their body from just their head. What? No other animal on Earth does anything like this. And it's surprising in more ways than are initially obvious. Photosynthesis may seem passive, just plants, or in this case slugs, quietly absorbing the power of the sun. But in reality, it's a highly dynamic balancing act. Photosynthesis is powerful, but also risky. Too much of it at the wrong time can be fatal, so plants must carefully regulate many other systems to make it work safely and efficiently. But Sacoglossins don't steal every piece of plant machinery, just the chloroplasts. They don't have all of the rest of plant DNA that plants definitely need in order to not die from oxidative stress. So how on earth do the slugs manage to pull this off with only one of the puzzle pieces? Plus, how do Sacoglossins maintain functional plant chloroplasts within their own animal cells, without the support of the algal nucleus? And how does all of this give them the ability to voluntarily decapitate themselves? Sacoglossins, often called sap-sucking sea slugs, are a group of small marine gastropods known for their vibrant colors, leaf-like shapes, and their ability to steal and use chloroplasts from algae. And some of these slugs are extremely small. Way, way smaller than I expected. Like, so tiny. The leaf sheep gets to be only about 7 millimeters long. Other species can be about 5 centimeters in length, and many resemble bits of floating seaweed or decorative lettuce leaves, making them excellent at camouflage. They're found in shallow coastal waters around the world, especially in tropical and subtropical regions. And they're usually found in seagrass beds, coral reefs, and tide pools where algae, their main food source, grows in abundance. Among the most iconic Sacoglossins is Alicia chlorotica, found along the eastern coast of North America. It resembles a vibrant, bright green leaf. Another standout is Alicia crispata, or the lettuce sea slug, native to the Caribbean. Its frilly parapodia give it the appearance of a ruffled salad, and it can display brilliant shades of green, purple, and white. And then there's Costasiella kuroshime from the start of this video, which lives in the Indo-Pacific. It's dubbed the leaf sheep due to its rhinophores that look like sheep ears and its endearing face. For a long time, scuba divers and scientists observed Sacoglossins eating algae, but it wasn't immediately obvious that they were stealing chloroplasts, and it definitely wasn't obvious that they were using these to photosynthesize. How do we know for sure that they're actually photosynthesizing and not simply turning green for the fashion statement? In 1965, scientists provided the first microscopic evidence showing that the green coloration of the Sacoglossin sea slugs was in fact chloroplasts retained from algal prey. Then in the 1970s, scientists discovered that these retained chloroplasts remained photosynthetically active within the sea slug's tissue. So how can scientists know for sure that the slugs are using photosynthesis as a source of energy? 
They can keep them in the dark. It sounds a little mean, but scientists can compare animal weight and survival rates of sea slugs deprived of sunlight. In this graph, you can see the weight changes in a Sacoglossin, who is given algae to eat along with light. It fluctuates a little bit, but stays more or less steady. Then the scientists tested the slug's weight changes when it was deprived of the algal food, but still had light. A notable drop. And then they tested their weight change when they were deprived of both algae and light. This caused a much more severe drop. The light then seems to be playing a large role in their nutrition. The most amazing example of a sea slug relying on photosynthesis is probably Alicia chlorotica. It can survive just on light and CO2 with no supplementary food at all for nine months. But how does the sea slug get the chloroplast in there in the first place? First, the sea slug uses its specialized radula-like mouth part to pierce algal cells. It then sucks out the contents, and instead of digesting everything, the slug selectively retains the chloroplasts and stores them in its digestive tubules, aka the diverticula. These tubules branch extensively through the slug's body, including into its frilly sides, called serrata or parapodia depending on the species, which helps maximize light exposure for photosynthesis. But this brings up the next question. How do they regulate light intake like plants do without the other plant systems? Plants are in a constant balancing act, trying to get enough energy from sunlight while trying to avoid the damage photosynthesis can cause. It's a surprisingly risky game. Here's what I mean by this. When a plant absorbs more light energy than it can use for photosynthesis, which can happen especially under bright light or when the plant is under other stress like drought, the excess energy has to go somewhere. If it's not safely dissipated, it can excite molecules in the chloroplast in a way that leads to the formation of something dangerous called reactive oxygen species like superoxide or hydrogen peroxide, which are chemically unstable and attack proteins, lipids, and DNA. In chloroplasts, they can damage the photosystems, especially photosystem 2, making it less efficient and requiring constant repair. To minimize this damage, plants do three main things. One, they can release the excess energy as heat. Two, they can neutralize the reactive oxygen species directly with antioxidants like ascorbate. Or three, they can use enzymes to convert the harmful molecules into less harmful ones like water or regular oxygen. But here's the thing. Most of the regulatory proteins and enzymes needed for all of this come from the algal nucleus, not the chloroplast itself. And sacoglossins don't have that algal nucleus, just the chloroplast. And yet, sacoglossins can keep their stolen chloroplasts functional for months while avoiding ROS damage. How? One method is simple and kind of obvious. They just move to the shade or adjust their depth in the water column to regulate light exposure, reducing potential light-induced stress on their kleptoplasts. Sort of like my friends who don't believe in sunscreen. Some slugs even possess parapodia, dorsal extensions of their foot, that they can fold over their bodies to shield kleptoplasts from excessive light, which is pretty cute. But the solar-powered slugs have even more tricks than this. One study found that they can organize chloroplasts into dense aggregations, which helps protect inner chloroplasts from intense light. Some slugs even have pigments that act as sunscreens, filtering harmful light wavelengths and safeguarding the kleptoplasts. And perhaps most impressively, it seems that the sacoglossins can choose algae to steal from that has especially stable chloroplasts. But even with these tactics, it's still surprising that a chloroplast can function at all within the cells of an animal, in a totally foreign environment, without its original host's DNA. For years, scientists almost literally could not believe it was possible. Many posited that horizontal gene transfer must be occurring, that some of the algal genome must be incorporated into the genome of the slug, a cross-kingdom gene transfer. It would be big if true. But it wasn't, or at least probably not. Several recent and rigorous studies sequenced the genome of sacoglossins and found no evidence for the idea. Therefore, other factors including the inherent stability of the chloroplasts and additional photoprotective mechanisms are the main ways that sacoglossins can maintain their chloroplasts. 
Okay, that's enough cellular biology, let's get to the fun part. How and why do some sea slugs chop their own heads off? The shedding of a body part on purpose is called autotomy, and if you're a Florida kid like me, you're probably familiar with this when lizards flick their own tails off when you try to catch them. Lots of animals can do some version of this, like crabs, octopuses, worms, or spiders. It happens normally when a predator grabs a part of the animal, and the animal ditches that body part to save themselves from being eaten entirely. The animal then regrows the shed body part, which is usually a tail or a leg. But some sacoglossins take this to the extreme. They don't shed a piece of their tail, they shed their entire body, including vital organs such as the heart and digestive system, and only retain their head. This 2021 study shows the process in remarkable detail, in two species of sacroglossin. In this video, you can first see that the slugs have a line on their neck that the scientists call the suspected breakage plane. It looks and acts like a perforated edge, a built-in dotted line. The researchers then induce breakage along this breakage plane with a piece of nylon, sort of like how you pop a baby tooth out with floss. It seems cruel, but remember, it's about to do something absolutely insane. The scientists note that the heart remains in the back half of the slug. Then, you can start to see signs of decomposition where the nylon string is cutting. And then, 22 hours or so later, the slug pops its head right off, and it crawls around on its own, feeding and everything. I can't decide if this is the coolest or creepiest thing I have ever seen. Anyway, during this time, the discarded body starts to decompose, then a day or so after the head has become independent, its wounds start to smooth over. After about seven days, the heart and parapodia start to be regenerated. As the days go on, more and more of the body regrows. Soon, it starts to look like a whole slug again. And after just 17 days, the slug is good as new. So the detached heads not only survive, but also regenerate complete bodies within a few weeks. The researchers observed that this self-decapitation is not a one-time event. Some individuals underwent the process multiple times. The slugs initiated autotomy through that specific breakage plane in their necks, suggesting that the slugs have adapted to do just this. Why though? Is it just to protect against predation? The researchers don't think so. The autotomy takes too long to be effective against predators. And when the researchers imitated predator attacks, the slugs didn't drop their bodies off. Instead, the researchers suggest it could be a strategy to eliminate internal parasites or damaged tissues, or to untangle themselves if they get caught in seaweed. Okay, so that likely explains the why, but how? How can an animal lose its heart and digestive system and still live? The answer appears to come back to those stolen chloroplasts. The chloroplasts, housed within the cells of the slug's head, continue to photosynthesize, providing essential energy during the regeneration process when the slug lacks a digestive system. The plant cells living inside of its head keep it alive. How it survives without a heart, though, is less clear. To me, this all sort of makes sacroglossins seem like a new type of animal, since they challenge the traditional beliefs about what animals can do. They blur the lines between animal and plant, and seem to be more powerful than the sum of their parts. But the thing is, to really understand how an animal like this is even possible, how it steals chloroplasts, how it survives without organs, how its cells keep running, you have to understand the systems underneath it all. And the backbone of these systems, like any natural system, is math and physics. As someone who loves animals but is easily bored by machines, I never thought I was a physics or math person. But it turns out, the same principles engineers rely on to build technology are the ones evolution has been shaping for millions of years. It's all connected. Mathematically, physically, cosmically. So if you want to start developing this kind of intuitive understanding of how everything in the world works, Brilliant is a great place to start. Brilliant takes complex, abstract ideas and turns them into clear, interactive lessons. Brilliant's scientific thinking course trains you to break complex systems into smaller parts, spot patterns, and reason through cause and effect. It will help you develop your scientific intuition through visual, interactive problem solving, 
that gets you hands-on with key concepts. You'll learn to think like a scientist with lessons on electric and digital circuits, gear systems, physical structures, and more. And when you apply that kind of mindset to a leaf-eating sea slug that steals chloroplasts and keeps them running inside its own body, the whole story becomes even more incredible. You start to see how each piece of the puzzle, energy, cells, structure, adaptation, fits together, and the weird biology of these slugs transforms from what on earth to wow, that actually makes sense. And I know things like physics can seem intimidating, but Brilliant starts you with mastering the foundations, then helps you level up to increasingly challenging problems. It's the best way that I've found to stay sharp in these subjects. It's been so long since I first learned calculus or physics in school that frankly I've forgotten a lot of the key concepts. But Brilliant helps me learn a little bit every day, and is so essential for both my personal and professional growth. Brilliant keeps me on track to reaching my learning goals one day at a time. So to learn for free on Brilliant, go to brilliant.org slash real science, scan the QR code on screen, or click on the link in the description. Brilliant's also given our viewers 20% off an annual premium subscription, which gives you unlimited daily access to everything on Brilliant.